Welcome to Moon Knight Episode 1 Thoughts. This episode is called The Goldfish Problem, and there will be spoilers for the MCU leading up to this point, including this episode. Now, I I just wanted to make clear, I'm not such a casual fan. You know, I put, not sure how well you can see it, but I put the Dark Knight back there. I'm not such a casual fan that I don't realize that's a completely different continuity, even different, you know, different film company making it, different comic company. I put it there because there are some similarities between Moon Knight and Batman. Not saying one's a rib of, of the other. So, I thought this was a great pilot. Uh, it's one of my favorite pilots of the MCU shows so far. I love the turn right at the very start of, of this episode. Like, It looks like, oh, he's just getting a drink of water. And then he smashes the glass, which is already a red flag. Then he puts it in his shoes. Holy crap. And this is his morning routine. He walks on glass all day, every day. Really great way to open the show. Tells us something important about... Yeah, I was, uh, it's... are we sure he's going to be the main villain? Because I saw like an interview where Ethan Hawke said he's not sure if it's technically... I'm just going to call him Arthur from now on. For now. And Steven wakes up, goes through his morning routine, all about making sure he didn't do something between going to bed and waking up. Sand on the floor, tape on the floor, his leg in a straight jacket thing. Dude, I think that girl might be a little too young for the grislier details of the organ thing of the mummies. Although I actually, honestly, that probably is something they, they tell even children. that It's... it's it's something you can bear to, to wait. It's not like they're going to go out and try it if you don't warn them about it. And, yeah, we see that he invited a woman on a date and forgot about it. I, I mean, I guess the idea is supposed to be that it's Mark who did it. And, like, I don't know if he just called himself Stephen, if he imitated Stephen's accent, because otherwise there's going to be trouble, but... And I guess he just figured, it's it's okay, Stephen will, uh, to be fair, never underestimate what a man will accept if it's going to get him laid. And Stephen is hugely overqualified for what they have him doing at the museum. And it's no wonder he's attracted to the museum itself with his love of Egyptian mythology. And that's a great, like, if you're lead is always talking about one of the major because let's be honest a lot of us don't know that much about egyptian mythology so yeah you know having you know he's he's throughout this episode he's he's talking about these i, I guess it's mostly in these early scenes he's talking about the the Inead and the various gods and he's talking about what they ate in egypt which okay that's not super important Although, no, no, never mind. And Stephen's talking to the living statue. No one else listens. And he paid the living statue for, I guess, being a great listener. Not much of an active listener, but you take what you can get. I do really appreciate, you know, he, like, he took, you know, a couple of tourists asked him, take a picture of us with him, with the living statue. And Stephen was like, don't forget the tip. And... Because it's like, you know, the living statue isn't going to break character to ask for that. But yeah, you know, that is kind of the idea. You know, he puts in a lot of effort to, to do this. They just took a picture with him, you know, give him a tip. So clearly, Stephen, you know, does really respect his, his, you know, the man and his profession. Excellent montage of him trying to stay awake. I really love that, you know, first we just, he's going through all the different things that are suggested. You know, do a puzzle read a book, you know, and then he has to start over, and then there's overlap in the audio, which is a great, like, that's when you know you've been listening to the same thing for too long, when when there starts being overlapping, not, not in real life, but in a, you know, in a piece of fiction. And he's reading about the Inead, which I'm guessing will be important for the whole Moon Knight thing, and, you know, so, some people pointed out that we see the, the Inead, as the the you know tape for helping you stay awake says something like 
is there a particular chapter of a book that you'd love to be a part of, you know? And he wakes up in a field with like a dislocated jaw, I guess, and he has no idea how he got there. And you're not supposed to be here. Yeah, I completely agree. And this is a guy in the window. He's like, hi. And he responds by firing on him. That's when you know that you are not prepared for the situation you find yourself in. And, you know, of course, like, Steven's not used to being fired upon. So he's just like, oh, you know, this is another person. I'm, I'm going to wave to him. And Steven put up the hood, which foreshadows his Moon Knight appearance. Also, he's clearly played an Assassin's Creed game. Trying out that social stealth. And we see the cult in action. And I really love, you know, the, the guy's being judged. The tattoo on Arthur of the scales move. You know, weighing the good and bad of his soul to see if he is deserving of the power. And the, the thing of just the... Uh, what's the word? Yeah, I, I can't describe it in, in detail, but, you know, people who know more about Egyptian mythology than I do can. The the thing is, you know, the your soul has to be lighter than a feather. I, I don't know how a soul, the, the weight of a soul, what that has to do with how good, oh, like, oh, the, okay, more bad deeds weigh you down. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. I believe you. And then she still dies. That makes it so much worse than if he said, you must be lying. I don't believe you. And I love that, like, the cult members, they're not freaking out. They're like, you know, that's that's the chance you get. That, that's, uh, that's, that's the chance you take when you engage in this. And, and the woman herself didn't seem confused that it was happening, just surprised. You know, she's like, but I've lived a good life. You know, she's not like, what is going on? You know, I've never experienced this, you know. And the cult so a couple of cult members go up and they, they just drag her off. And then they're ready for the next, you know, because this is just, just, this is what happens. You know, you 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 risk the, yeah. And, and Arthur even says something along the lines of, I'm sorry you won't be a part of what, is coming or something like that you know so he thinks he's making the world a better place and he legitimately empathizes with her he he doesn't think ah you know good let's be rid of this evil evil person you know he, he believes that she'll do evil in the future but he still doesn't think you know good thing she's dead and arthur says something in egyptian steven's the only person who doesn't understand gives himself away by kneeling too slowly don't know what I'm saying like that. Yeah, we've all been wondering about the accent choice. I'm just kidding. I think it's fine. In in general, I make jokes about this episode. I love this episode. I'm not really... I, I don't have very much to criticize about it. And Conchu takes control of Steven's body to, pretend, to prevent him from giving away the scarab. I like that by the end of the episode, we still don't know what the scarab is all about. We really badly want to find out in another episode. You know, it, it's a good hook. It's like, okay... Conchu doesn't want to give it up. Arthur wants it, and he's willing to kill for it. You know, and I like, at first, he's just like, I want you to give that to me. You know, he gives him the chance. And when, like, he, he even gives him, like, I don't know, a good 30 seconds to hand it over. And only then is he like, okay, you know, snaps his fingers, a couple of cult members grab him. You know, so, yeah, he, he was legitimately willing to... You know, and he, I, I, uh, did he, did he recognize him before or after? He said, I, re I know you. I forget if that was before or after the scarab not being handed over. Anyway, Stephen blacks out, comes back, blood on his hands, cult members dead. I saw one of the, one of the Easter egg people, video people point out, he must have, like, ripped off some fingers or something for, you know, for that much blood. And, yeah. I like that the, you know, the the Cupcake Vans playing Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, good song choice, because Wake Me Up, he's he thinks it's insomnia, nightmares and such, and I believe that that's the kind of thing that would play naturally in a Cupcake Van, 
I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I figure it's probably radio station, but I'm saying that's the kind of radio station that it would be set to. And the show makes it clear that it's diegetic. That actually is playing inside the van. That's why we can't hear it as well when the camera is like really far up above the van. And Steven attacks with a, a cupcake. Someone takes over, uses a gun instead. It's slightly more effective. Did he just throw the gun? Can't you would be excellent on the riff tracks. Steven wakes up in his bed. Now we wonder if everything we've just seen was all a dream or maybe a premonition or possibly like a flashback, something that happened in the past, you know. But then, you know, he's two days late for the date. So what we saw did happen. Afterwards, Mark put Steven back in bed, put all his stuff back in place. You know, the, the like, he, he must have... Like the you know the moment that he gets out of bed, there's there's footprints in the sand. So Mark has to pour out new sand, or I guess wipe whatever you know, and he puts tape on the on the door panel and the whole thing. And he must have bought him a new fish. I mean, the old one. I I don't know much about fish, but I could imagine it would one would die if it isn't being fed for two whole days. And that's why the pet shop girl said he was there the day before talking about buying a one fin fish since then Steven wouldn't have realized it had been replaced. And I, I, I like that that's like that's an that's a level of attention to detail that like if you thought that you were like that that weird stuff was going on around you, you know, you, you would be hyper focused and notice something like that. And Steven sees some stuff has been moved in his apartment and investigates. And it does also make sense. You know, Mark isn't, you know, Conchu notwithstanding, Mark himself is not superhuman. He would miss something. And the cell phone tells him he missed. I, I didn't catch the last count, but like 48 calls from Layla. And, you know, she calls and it's been months since she heard from him. She's not a fan of the accent either. And now Mark start, starts talking directly to Steven. I really love that we start in media res before seeing the origin story for Moon Knight. It's so much more effective. At, at the end of the day, like his origin story, you know, it's good, but it's not like hugely unique for a comic book. Like, you know, something tragic happened. Then he got superpowers. Now he's an anti-hero. Like, it's not. It's not a, it's not super original. Mark shows up in the mirror, and we get some stuff with the inherently creepy nature of elevators. Honestly, kind of got Silent Hill vibes from the whole elevator thing. The the you know you press a button and then just you know like uh, I don't know if I want to give that okay. Brief spoiler for the first Silent Hill game. There's a bit where you get into an elevator and you go to all the different floors. I think there's like three. And, you know, each time you can't open the door in the room that the elevator leads to. So, you know, you're like, what, what am I supposed to do? And you go back in the elevator and suddenly there's a button for the fourth floor, you know. Not supposed to be there. Same as how in this it goes back down the floors. Even, yeah. No more spoilers for Silent Hill for the time being. And we get the bit from the trailer where Kanchu approaches the elevator and then it's an old lady instead. And, you know, these three people point out in their videos, that's still sus. Because if she was approaching from that far down as we saw Kanchu, you know, it's, if it was just that he was seeing the old lady looking like Kanchu then how could she summon the elevator? Why would the elevator stop on her floor if she was that far away, you know? Unless she has, like, telekinesis. And she seems really freaked out by him, so I'm guessing she has no superpowers. And Khonshu caught up with him, and he wakes back up on, I think that's a bus. It's definitely public transportation, which, you know, so, some people pointed out that's, a good detail because in England public transportation isn't seen as something bad you know I don't live in America so but I am aware I, I don't mind public transportation 
but a lot of Americans really hate it because their public transportation is not good. And yeah, you know, Stephen isn't. If Stephen lived in America, I think he would probably try to find an alternative. Although I guess I'm not sure who he has to drive him to work, and he doesn't have a driver's license. He says so. Yeah. Anyway, I love the sound design for the God and the music they chose. Very effective. And I like that Arthur was on the bus as well. You know, a lot of villains have cool, iconic transports. I guess uh, Arthur's operating on a budget. But yeah, he was act Arthur was standing fairly close to where Stephen was. So you have to wonder if Arthur either did approach him or was just about to approach him. And Stephen calls security, but he's a cult member. You can really understand where Arthur's coming from. Hitler, Nero, the Iranian Genocide, Pol Pot. Avatar, Blue People, love that film. Oh, uh, the anime. <laughs> wow. And Stephen causes a sound distraction to get away from the Jackal. So, he, yeah, he, the dude's played stealth games, clearly. I'm thinking Thief. Steven seems like the kind of guy who can appreciate quality, even though it's like an old game. And Mark talks directly to Steven through the mirrors, and Steven lets Mark take over, and Moon Knight beats the creature to death. So the episode ends on a really cool reveal of Moon Knight. His, like, completely bright white eyes, like, you know, he doesn't look in at the camera lens, but he is looking in our direction, and it's very creepy. And it's like a number of comic book characters don't have pupils, but it's not that common that we see that in these relatively serious grounded adaptations of comic books. So I quite appreciate that, yeah. Like, I, I want to say, even, like, classic Batman stories, he wouldn't have pupils. Like, can you imagine a Batman movie where you just can't see his pupils at all? That's, you know, a, a live-action one, I mean. I think some of the animated ones have also done it. I'm not that familiar with them. I know I should be. They're, I've heard they're great. And the ones I've watched are great. Return of the Joker, I want to say, is one of the ones I watched. Love it. The ending, absolutely love. Yeah. So we're already seeing that it is in part about our protagonist having disassociative identity disorder. Another thing, it's more brutal and violent than other MCU. So far, there isn't a single bit of connective tissue between this and the rest of the MCU. They didn't even mention the blip, which for some reason people are freaking out. But I, I don't, I don't know why it's a big deal. I, would you really, are you, are you really telling me that if half the population of the earth and half the animals disappeared for five years people wouldn't talk about it there wouldn't be posters up at, about you know if if you're still dealing with trauma from it you can talk to people. you know anyway but there hasn't been a single reference to it. it i grant that it is possible this is taking place before the blip but still not a single reference like nobody said this is just as weird as this or that you know thing that happened in the mcu like, when, you know, Steven starts seeing supernatural stuff, like, he doesn't stop and go, I should, you know, I hope Thor is nearby, you know, some something that, yeah. But, but yeah, to return to my notes, like, if not for the logo at the start, and it being on Disney+, Plus, by which I mean it being a Disney+, Plus original, I am aware that there are other comic book properties on Disney+, Plus that didn't originate on there, and are not connected to the MCU, you might not even guess that this was MCU, which I quite appreciate. And I suppose I should say really quickly, I love the MCU. I'm not, I'm not dissing the MCU. And yeah, you know, it's, it's not quite clear yet when this is set in the MCU. I don't think we've been told a year or anything. I, I really appreciate, you know, like with WandaVision, I love it when you start a story and the audience has no idea what's going on. Like, I mean, okay, so there are modern relatives. Did we see a smartphone? We saw a flip phone. So obviously, like, it's not taking place in, like, the, I don't know, uh, 1980s or something. You know, it's sometime in, in the, you know, it's it's in the relatively recent past, if not the present. But still. 
and apparently, like I want to say it was an interview, originally there were easter eggs, but they removed them. I like that after Steven introduces himself as Steven Grant gift shopist, or, you know, uh, Arthur calls him, I, th I think he just says, Steven Grant of the gift shop, or something like that, you know, just, yeah. And he doesn't seem to look down on it, you know, he's just like, this is, you know, like, He's like he's like paging him over the over the you know air, airport intercom or something. Inter is that intercom? Whatever. I think you know what I'm talking about. Jesse Gender points out that this idea of the Egyptian god judging you for things you haven't done yet is like Minority Report, which is an interesting ethical question. Hopefully, they'll put their own spin on it in future episodes. I don't really have anything to add to that. I think she absolutely nailed it. And Steven goes to the pet shop, and the person there working there is like, I don't care what that Nemo movie told you. Although, if you were to need something to calm the kids down in the coming days, I wouldn't mind if you remember that it's also right here on Disney+. Plus. Am I, am I winking with the wrong eye? This episode really shows that it is possible to do the Venom concept well in live action because I found this episode substantially funnier and scarier than either of those movies. And I still, I don't hate those movies, but they're kind of messy. The ending of this episode really highlights that Moon Knight is not a hero. He is an anti-hero. We see that, you know, the Jackal is losing the fight. It's trying to outrun, to flee the Moon Knight, and instead of just letting it go, or maybe just trying to stop it in a relatively non-violent way, he grabs it by its leg, pulls it back, and beats it to a pulp. After a while, all I'm doing is punching wet chips of bone into the floorboards, so I stop. So if I understand correctly, basically Steven believes that he is suffering from sleepwalking, and that, you know, hence Sand chained himself to the bed. Let's see. He, yeah, he won't know how to deal with those in his sleep and end up doing something awful in his sleep. And then by the end of this episode, he realizes there's something else going on. I, I don't know if he would, if he already recognizes it as disassociative identity disorder. And yeah, so the episode end, uh, opens on Arthur. I've seen an interview where one of the people working on the show said that he wasn't sure if Arthur was supposed to be the villain, just... An antagonist, maybe actually secretly a hero. I've long said that it's a good idea to open a comic book story with a strong establishing scene of either the hero or the villain. I'm not saying it has to be every single movie. It's not a universal rule. It's just often a good idea. So I quite like the technically hook. He could be either. What he does in the opening scene isn't evil. It shows his devotion. And for all we know, the scare will actually enable Arthur to do something good. And, yeah, also, real quick, I love the this kind of, you know, some, some people say he's too creepy, he can't be a good guy, uh, you know, creepy cult thing, and uh, Ethan Hawke did say he based uh, the performance on the leader of the cult, the, the whole Waco, Texas thing, uh, yeah. Although, arguably, that story is also very much about how the FBI just completely freaked out and did not handle that situation well, but was it the FBI? Anyway, the, the law enforcement involved in that situation. But yeah, so let's see. Yeah, you know, it might enable Arthur to do some, something good. The Minority Report thing, if you could be 100% sure it's accurate, an argument could be made over whether or not it is ethical. One of the biggest ethical problems with the idea of Minority Report stuff, especially in the real world, is how could you possibly be 100% sure that the person would do the thing they're being judged for? You know, they haven't had a chance not to do it yet. I quite like how Arthur is very strategic in how he approaches Stephen. First he uses cult members, mercenaries, then when he's in London in the museum, he has to keep a low profile, he tries to use the judgment thing. He figures Stephen will die from that. And then when that doesn't work, you know, he, yeah. And at night, when the museum is empty, once again, low profile, he sends the Jackal, which is n not the Bruce Willis movie, but the original, uh, uh, the Day of the Jackal, excellent movie. It's com completely off topic, but just, yeah. I mean, the damage that the Jackal caused will raise an eyebrow too, but I mean, who's going to say, oh, it must be a Jackal summoned by a cult leader, you know, call the cult police. It's, yeah. 
and and again, that's you know, I, I I could see how it might just be again like oh, you know, we better we have, hopefully Loki will come and help figure out who did this, and you know, I mean, I would say the Agents of Shield, but I think by this point, I'm not sure there is much of an agency left, even if they got rid of all the Hydra. A anyway, love the episode. Super psyched to, to I I can barely wait a week, but you know I will I will just barely. T Holy crap! I'm glad we don't have to wait like a month or something. And yeah, it's it looks like this will be one of the very best MCU shows. So yeah, really really happy to, to yeah. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.